Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to share with you on the subject of how to walk as a Christian in relationships. Every one of us needs to walk in line with the Word of God when we are in dealing with relationships, whether we're dealing with relationships with those people that are Christians or whether we're dealing with people that are ungodly. First of all, John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. Notice, he says this is a new commandment. This is a brand, brand new, fresh new commandment. Why is it new? Because this commandment of agape love, something they did not have in the Old Testament, agape love is a love that realizes the valuableness, the preciousness, and the worth of an individual, and it is unconditional, without reservation. The Old Testament was a conditional love. The New Testament is con no, unconditional. We see every person is valuable, precious, and important. And we walk in love towards them without reservation. And as he says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. He expects every one of us to walk in love at all times. If we do this, then we're going to carry out what, certainly what love would do. And we see in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, Charity, which is love, same word, agape, suffereth long. It's long-suffering. It's kind. It looks for ways to be constructive, to minister to people. It does not envy. It does not vaunt itself, which means to puff itself up, or to, to boast of itself, it means. It's not puffed up, which means referring to pride. It does not behave itself unseemly. This is one who acts in a rude, unmannerly way. Seeks not her own. It's not selfish. It's not easily provoked, doesn't get irritated, upset, and anger so easily. Thinks no evil, it's going to think the best. It's going to believe, think the best about people. Rejoices not in iniquity when people have problems, but rejoices in the truth. Also, bears all things. Bear means to cover over. Instead of being a gossiper, it covers over things. Believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. God wants you always to walk in love at all times in your life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Notice what it says. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, which is the word, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That tells you there's something. The love that we have can't be like we're just going through the motions and faking it because we ought to do it. It's got to be a true love unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. If you are going to fulfill this, you're going to have a pure heart. You must have a clean heart right before the Lord, and as you obey the truth, it will have an effect of bringing a purification of your soul, as God wants us to be holy, spirit, soul, and body. In fact, in 1 Peter 4, <coughs> verse 8, it says this, Above all things, have fervent, fervent charity among yourselves. This is a stretched out, intent love for someone among yourselves. For charity covers the multitude of sins. It doesn't sit there and point out everybody's sins. It covers the multitude of sins. God wants us to walk in love at all times. doesn't matter what someone's done to you. You always walk in love. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all, or all men, even as we do toward you. That's what he wants. You're to increase and abound. So this is something that's going to develop in your life and you're going to become stronger and increase the fruits of love. To the end he may establish your heart unblameable. See, as you get walking in the ways of the word of God in all areas, it's going to do a work in your heart. And it's going to establish your heart unblameable in holiness because you walk in love. Regardless of what people do to us, we must always walk in love at all times. It is absolutely mandatory. We also must understand that we're to love every person 
even those that are against us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus said, But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's what we do at all times. In fact, this shows the change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This is the Old Testament law that Jesus speaks here. Verse 43 says, You've heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's what they did. They'd hate their enemy. Well, not anymore. I say unto you, love your enemies. You are to love every person regardless of what they do to you. Bless them that curse you. Do you not, you do not send curses back. People that have taught that you return curses to the sender are wrong. That's from the Old Testament, Psalms 109. We're not under the Old Testament any longer. We're under the New Testament. We do not return curses. That is evil. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children or the sons of your Father which is in heaven. Otherwise, if you're really going to be one of the sons of the Father, you are going to do these things. In fact, if you will do these things, it will solve your relationship problems. You're going to always walk in love. doesn't matter what someone does. You're always going to bless them. doesn't matter if they curse you. You're going to do good to them. doesn't matter what, what they have, attitudes they have towards you. You're going to pray for them regardless of what they do. That is the attitude that we must have. And we will be like the children of our Father in heaven. Note that he makes his son, the son to rise on the evil, on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? It's easy to love somebody that loves you because they, you know, they treat you good. You can treat them good back. Of course, you're going to respond to that. What reward have you? You don't have any reward. Even the publicans the same. The sinners, the world does that same thing. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? So do even the publicans also. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, which is to walk in love, to bless, to do good, and to pray for others, as it says, in all situations. That is what he expects. Another thing that's important is you must forgive. It is mandatory that you forgive every person whatever they might have done to you. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, the way that you treat someone is the way God's going to treat you. If you don't forgive them their trespasses, God's not going to be able to forgive your trespasses. You have to forgive. It is a choice at the point of your will. It has nothing to do with your feelings. You say, well, I don't feel like forgiving them. Or after I forgave them, I still had these thoughts and feelings of it. Well, that's because of the evil spirits that have come into you that give you those thoughts and attitudes. You're going to have to cast out those spirits of unforgiveness as well and drive them out. That's going to be also important if you are going to get free of the effects of having unforgiveness in the past. But you cannot hold unforgiveness. In fact, if you hold unforgiveness, not only are your sins not forgiven, but also you're going to be turned over to the tormentors, which are the demons. In Matthew chapter 18, <clears throat> this is where the one man had been forgiven a great debt, and then he had a servant who owed him a small debt, and he wouldn't forgive him that debt. Well, when the Lord found out that he wasn't going to forgive him the small debt, Verse 34, his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. You will be delivered to the tormentors, who are the evil spirits. Regardless of what's happened to you in your life, you must make a decision. It's a decision at the point of your will, in obedience to the word of God, to forgive every person who's wronged you or hurt you and let it go. And then you're going to need to cast out any of those spirits that have come into you. And you're going to walk in love at all times. Now, how about if someone has done you wrong and it's a present situation? What should you do? Well, you want to go and try to get this thing to get right. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, 
Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell them of the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So if there's somebody that's done something wrong, go to that person and talk to them about it. Hopefully they'll, you'll get the thing resolved, forgive one another, repent, turn away from those things, and work to, towards getting things resolved. That's what God wants. He wants us to see relationships be restored and re if, if possible. If they won't listen, though, then you just, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36, God also wants us to be merciful in every situation. God expects you to be merciful. Luke 6.36 says, Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Our Heavenly Father is so merciful towards us. He forgives us of our sins. God wants you to be merciful towards others. Be merciful like He's been merciful towards you. Show mercy. And what happens if you show mercy to others? Well, remember, however you treat others is what's going to happen for you in your own life. In Matthew, in chapter 5, <clears throat> We see here in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You will be able to obtain mercy because of the fact that you've done it to others. Whatever you do to others is going to come back unto you. Whatever you give out is coming back to you. So don't give out anything that you don't want coming back to you. Say, well, they deserve such and such. No, that makes you a judge. You cannot be judgmental of others whatsoever. That is going to bring judgment upon you. God is the judge, as we'll cover scriptures on that at a later time. Acts chapter 20. How does God want you to deal with people? He wants you to learn to be a giver, not selfish. If you're selfish, you're thinking about what I can get. No, God wants you to think about what can you give out to others. Acts 20, verse 35, I've showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the Lord's of our Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Be one who gives out. Give out to minister to people's needs. When you give out, give love, give encouragement, give a good word, <clears throat> then you're going to be blessed as you give out to others instead of just looking for whatever I can get. That is a selfish attitude and that is not what God wants. He also wants you to be a servant. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew 23, verse 11, he said, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Who have you been serving this week? God wants you to be a servant. As you serve others, that's the one that's the greatest in the eyes of the Lord. You want to be a giver and a servant of others. In fact, we see now in Galatians, Chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, you've been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. God wants you to serve one another as you walk in love at all times. You're going to serve them by doing good for them. You're going to look to do good things for them to help them. In fact, you're going to reach out to them to minister to particular needs in their life. It's what Jesus did. It's what he wants you to do. He wants you to be living a life of a servant ministering to others. In Romans chapter 15, verse 1, we that are strong ought to bear, this means really to, to take up and lift, get rid of it, the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good, to edification. We want to edify him. Even Christ pleased not himself. He didn't please himself. As it's written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. God does not want us to be walking a selfish life. We must live a life of giving out and being a servant to one another. Now, what about people that cause division? Well, there are people that have to be dealt with. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them. That means you, you make note of the, those that cause divisions or offenses contrary to the doctrine <clears throat> that you've learned, and avoid them. Otherwise, we don't have fellowship with them. Those people that have caused division, those people who have caused offenses, 
contrary to the doctrine and the teaching you've learned, you're going to avoid them. When it says avoid them, this is actually a commanding statement. It's in the imperative mood. It's not just a good idea because it'll have an adverse effect upon you. You avoid them. These ones that are doing this, they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We've got to be sure that we're only fellowship with people that are walking right. Anybody that causes division, anybody that causes offensive, anybody that walking contrary to the doctrine of the Word of God that you've learned, then you need to avoid them. Of course, you need to know the Word so you can understand what the truth is. At the same time, you need to be teachable. They may be having truth and maybe you have some error, so always be teachable and be willing to look at what you're bringing, what someone's bringing forth in light of the Word of God to see whether or not is the truth. You also need to stay away from anything that would cause division or strife. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That's what he wants. That there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, same view of things. That's why he wants us to come in one accord, in line with the words. We hear the word and we all are doing the word. We're going to speak the same thing. We're not going to have divisions. We want to be, he wants us to be perfectly joined together. He wants to bring the body of Christ into the unity of the word of walking in line with the word of God in the same mind and also in the same judgment. Well, they had a problem. Corinth had, the Corinthians had all kinds of problems that he was correcting them over. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the problem was they were saying, I'm of this group and I'm of that group and I'm following this guy and I'm following this guy and all these things. And it was a mistake. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3. He says, For you are yet carnal... For whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? While one saith, I'm a Paul, another said, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. Men are not anything. They're just vessels for people to flow through. So you don't get your eyes on people. You get your eyes on the Word, on Jesus, on the Word of God. And you always check everything out in line with the Word. God's the one who gives the increase. So he does not want to get our focus on men. You know, I remember one time I was sharing with someone about how the present tense of Mark chapter 11, 23, how you say unto the mountain continually to cast it out. And this person said, well, I don't do that. I said, well, why not? I said, I showed it to him right on the screen. It was argumentative against what I was teaching. And I said, uh, because the Bible shows the present tense that we continually speak to the mountain until it's removed. We don't, he well, I've been taught that we speak one time. He said, so brother so-and-so says that we speak one time. He followed a particular person. Following a person instead of checking it out in line with the word. I said, well, I understand that so-and-so says such-and-such. Such. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what so-and-so says. It only matters what the Word says. And if the Word says and shows it's a present tense and it's continuous repeated action of doing that, then that's what we're supposed to do. He got mad about it. He said he's going to follow that guy and end up leaving our church. You know, what can you do? Some people are that way. Don't get your eyes on men. Get your eyes on the Word and be sure, of course, it's in line with the Word of God. That we need to be teachable and receptive to truth. Now, how about if there's sin? It needs to be confronted. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. That's terrible. Incestual relationship going on. You're puffed up and have not rather mourned. But he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. If he wouldn't come to repentance, he had to be removed. They were just kind of, you know, turning their head, not looking another way. It happens a lot. You cannot look another way because it will, is a contaminating effect upon a church. He goes on and says, I verily is absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one as Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Otherwise, this guy, because he wouldn't repent, he's going to be disfellowshipped and kicked out, turned over to the devil. Well, why would that be? Because of the fact he was already on the devil's territory because he was walking in sin. And what would happen? It would bring the destruction of his flesh. I want you to notice, though, something here. It says that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It's a little bit misleading if, unless you understand what's being said. Many people think, well, it looks like he got turned over to Satan, but he still got saved. Well, that's not what it's saying. The reason is because it is not a statement of fact that the Spirit may be saved, that it's a factual statement. How do we know? Because you have to look up the words. When we look up the words here, if you're here for the first time, we bring out things that are important to understand to see what's being said. Verbs in the Greek have tense, voice, and mood. The moods are important, and especially when you see a subjunctive mood. If it's a statement of fact, it's what's called an indicative mood in the Greek. This is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood expresses things that are not facts conditional upon conditions being met. Otherwise, a conditional statement. So the statement that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus is a conditional statement. What would be the condition to be met? That the guy repented and turned away from his ancestral relationship. Otherwise, he would be doomed. He would not be saved. Because fornicators end up in, they don't enter in the kingdom of God, and they end up in the, in the lake of fire, if you read in the Word of God. So just to help you on that, that's a conditional statement. The guy would repent, then he would get right. <clears throat> but they had to deal with this. He said, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Well, leaven is a type of sin. A little bit of sin would contaminate the whole group. So them not dealing with it allows it to contaminate everybody. That's why we all have to deal with sin. And we cannot allow that, of course, to go on in, in a church. Furthermore, even in your own life. A little sin is going to contaminate you. You can't have any sin. It's going to contaminate well, I've got, I'm doing good in all these areas, but I've got this one area over here. Now you need to get rid of them all. The sin that so easily besets you, get rid of it. It's contaminating you. We must deal with all sin in our life and turn away from it. And we've got to confront those that are not walking right. If they're not walking right, we, of course, we encourage them to come to repentance. But if they won't come to repentance and they won't listen, then you know, you cannot continue to have fellowship with them. In fact, Corinth had a lot of problems, and Paul kept coming to them. And so, well, if you talk to them once, should you come to them again? Sure you should. As long as they'll listen to you, keep coming to them. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Now, he says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. He came to them once, he came to them twice, and now he's coming to them a third time trying to get these guys straightened out. That doesn't mean you write someone off. You keep on working towards helping them come to the place of repentance. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time, being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you prove, seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, to which to you it is not weak, but is mighty in you. And so he was coming to them. And we jump down to verse 10. He says, therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness. I'm coming a third time. I'm going to have to, you know, really t lay it out to you. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, not to destruction. They were continuing to walk in ways that were wrong. They continued to walk in ways that were evil instead of doing the things that God wanted. They wouldn't repent. God expects us to confront things. We cannot allow sin in the camp. We cannot allow sin to go on in our household. We must be ready to confront situations. We cannot compromise. In fact, we see in Genesis, talking about our household. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. Notice what it says. This is God speaking regarding Abraham. We know that from the verse before, where it says, Seeing Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, I know Abraham, God says, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, 
that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that from that which he hath spoken of him. Notice, he had confidence that he'd command his household and his children after the way of the Lord, that they would do it. That's what we need to do. You command your household to walk in line with the word of God, and you direct them to do what is right. And notice, this was a key. He had to do this, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he was spoken of. Otherwise, it wasn't automatic. It was conditional. You want to see the promises of God come to pass, the things that God purposes for you to come to pass? Well, then you're going to have to command your household after that and walk in the ways of the Lord. We can't compromise whatsoever. No way. At the same time, well, you know, what am I going to do if this household will not come in line? Well, a couple things. First of all, you're going to keep exhorting them to come in line with the Word of God. <clears throat> Over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. He said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. This is someone that's speaking right, speaking in line with the word of God. He's going to be confessed before the Father. Whoever denies me before men will be denied before my Father. <laughs> People that are denying him are going to be denied. That means they're going to be in trouble. They're not going to be right with God whatsoever. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth, but I'm not come to send peace but a sword. What does a sword do? It divides. It divides between those who are walking the right way and those who are walking the wrong way. I'm come to set it man, a man at variance against his father's daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's foes shall be they of his own household. We must not compromise for anybody in our household. If we have some people in our household that won't walk right, don't compromise and back off. Keep exhorting them to do what is right. At the same time, they could be a foe, even though they're acting the way they, they are. You keep on walking right. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You cannot compromise for a father or for a mother. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You cannot compromise for a son or a daughter, for anybody in the household whatsoever. He that taketh not his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. That's the crucifying of the flesh and following him. You and I must put the Word of God first place in all relationships and all our dealings. Otherwise, we will not be worthy of the Lord. He's expecting you and my eye to walk right. Now, what about people that would choose to walk contrary to the Word of God? Well, you're not going to stand by idly and let it carry on. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see over in verse 27. <coughs> this is talking about Eli. And his sons were doing evil things. They were carrying on fornication in the temple, and they were doing evil things. Verse 27, There came a man of God unto Eli. Eli was the priest. He said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick you at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me? If you let sin go on in your household through a person and you have not chosen to deal with that, you're honoring them above the Lord. To make yourself fat were the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He was, his eyes were on the money. You know, well, I don't want to compromise. You're going to make sure everything's coming in for me. You can't do that. You can never compromise. You've got to do what's right. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. <clears throat> for them that honor me will I honor. See, however you treat God is the way he's going to treat you. They that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I'll cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. Yeah, their whole, whole household's going to go. Thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, all the wealth that Israel, God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. Otherwise, all the things that you've been trying to accumulate, they're all going to be gone. <coughs> man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes, to grieve thine heart. All the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. You've been doing this for all your money and stuff. It's all going away, and it will go away. 
You've got to honor the Lord. This will be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. Wow. Now, why would they die? Because they were continuing to sin, and he did not do something about it. In chapter 3, verse 12. In that day I will perform against Eli, Eli all things that I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. God is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, which because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. You have to restrain the people in your household. You can't make them choose right, but you can restrain them from doing evil. You've got to restrain him. He didn't. He knew it. He knew what was going on, and he was just letting it go on. You cannot compromise. You're going to be in trouble. Therefore, I've sworn on the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. You're not going to be able to offer up some sacrifice and get rid of this. Nope. The judgment is going to come because of the fact that he would not choose the way of the Lord. Well, that's exactly what happened. In chapter 4, we come down here and we see what was going on. Here's when all of a sudden they were out in battle. Eli heard the noise of the cry and he said, What means the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, eyes were dim, could not see. He said to Eli, I am he that came out of the army and I fled today out of the army. And he said, Where is, what's, what's there done, my son? He said, Israel's fled before Philistines. There's been a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. The judgment came upon them because he did not restrain his sons from evil, and he ended up falling backward off the seat, and he died himself. Judgment will come if we do not restrain our household from sin, and if we do not honor the Lord above anybody in our household. Never compromise for another person. Now, many times people have said, well, husband says, wife, you're supposed to submit to me. <laughs> you only submit as unto the Lord. You don't do anything contrary to the word of God. Everybody must do what is right in sight of the word of God and walk in line with it. We cannot ever compromise for anybody. God wants the word of God put forth in our, our household that we're going to walk according to that. And that is important. Now, <clears throat> if people will not listen, you know, you just keep on sowing the seed and keep restraining from evil, you got to set the boundaries. And when they, when they lie or cheat or whatever or do whatever they do or try to do things secretly, God will even work to discover them. I remember when we were restraining one of our children who was not making the right choice and was starting to smoke cigarettes. And we said, no, you're not doing that. And we said, took him away, of course. Well, it turned out he secretly, behind our back, was choosing to do it. Well, the Lord gave Renee a word of knowledge, or actually it was a vision she had. And in this vision, she saw a pack of cigarettes and she saw exactly where they were. They were hidden in this little pocket and in a thing where the bike was. It was hidden underneath in this little pouch. She went, found it. Of course, he got exposed, and that was it. That was the end for that. Dealt with him. I'll tell you, God will give you words and show you things to bring forth the, what evil would be going on if you have a heart to want to do what's right. And we were going to do what's right. We weren't going to compromise for nobody. Didn't matter what they thought. God will bring those kind of things. Words of knowledge and things to reveal, to find them out, praise God. The person's sin will find them out, won't it? God wants us to do what is right. We can't compromise. We've got to walk the walk of the Lord. Now, another thing. <clears throat> you and I are out to be preaching the gospel. When we go out and preach the gospel to people, the gospel is confrontational. You have to know that. You're not going to, most people you go up and talk to, they're not just going to be jumping on the bandwagon ready to receive Jesus right off the bat and, run, you know, and follow in the way of the Lord. It is confrontational and it's going to require absolute change in their life. In Acts chapter 13, verse 6, here's a case 
where they went through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. And he, when he, which was with the deputy of the country, that'd be like the vice president of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Well, he heard about the word of God that was being preached by Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, and he wanted to hear it. So, Elimus the sorcerer, so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So what are you going to do? Are you going to back off and run? No, oh, Paul wasn't going to do that. Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why you got to get filled up with the Holy Spirit if you're God, you know. And why was he filled with the Holy Spirit? Because this guy was one who prayed, and he prayed in tongues. Remember, he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. He was a praiser and a worshiper, and all these things bring a filling of the Holy Spirit. He set his eyes on him. You see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a boldness to deal with situations. And he said, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. He told them like it was. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He confronted him. Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. A temporary judgment was pronounced over him. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. A deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Notice, this is called the doctrine of the Lord. To be able to put judgments on people that would obstruct the, the gospel. The gospel is confrontational. Anybody who tries to block it, you can deal with that. God wants us to never back off of things. We see another case in Acts chapter 16. Verse 16. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Well, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, it doesn't sound like she's, she's saying anything bad there, does it? Well, the translation's wrong. What's the problem? Notice it says, which show unto us the way of salvation. It sounds like, hey, they're pointing you towards Jesus, the way of the salvation. Not so. In the Greek, when you see the word the, it's called a definite article. And when there is a definite article, there is a Greek word specifically. In this case, there is no definite article present in the Greek. It should not be translated the way of salvation. Young's literal corrects the error. It is no the, so when there's not a the, it's translated a. That's the way it's translated correctly in the Greek. So what was she saying? Would show unto us a way of salvation. That's why it was bad. You, because the King James didn't translate things correctly. You never, you'll never see that unless you look things up. That's why you've got to look everything up. So what's wrong with that? Now, now we see a way of salvation, which means, oh, there's a whole lot of ways of salvation. Same thing's going forth today through all these people that are evil out there saying, there's many ways to God. They're all liars. Don't listen to them a bit. There's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ who paid the price of redemption. He's the one who was the firstborn from the dead. He is the one who has brought forth the church, the cornerstone of the church of God. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the only one raised from the dead. Only one. So that was the lie. Of course, this she did many days. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He confronted that. He cast the demon out of that person. That didn't get the person free of the problems in their life. That just got the demon out that was using her to do the works of the devil. You can cast out demons out of an unbeliever if you're destroying the works of the devil that are operating through them. Not to get them free. It didn't get them free, her free of any problem whatsoever. Just eliminated what the devil was doing. And he came out the same hour. I want you to notice that this wasn't just one quick, I command you to come out, and then that was it. How do we know? Because when it says how he was commanding, this is a present tense in the Greek. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing, repeated action. So literally it says he was commanding continually or her, to her, in the name of Jesus, commanding continually the Spirit to come out of her. He had to continually work at this thing to get it out because it was resisting. It had power. But it came out the same hour. Apparently he had a battle for a while. 
but he got it out. You have dominion over all devils and you can cast them out. You just keep casting them out until they come out. That's exactly what he did. He didn't back off. He didn't just kind of let it go by. You know, he had to confront it. He was, many days, he kind of let this thing go. Then he finally confronted it. We need to be ready to confront things. Do not compromise the gospel whatsoever. We see over in Acts chapter 17, in verse 16, you and I are to be servants of the Lord and to do what God wants. Look what it says. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him because he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Well, there's something wrong here. This city's messed up. This city's given to idolatry. It was revealed to him. So what's he going to do about it? He's not going to sit there and just do nothing. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. He confronted it. God wants you to come to the place of being one who is ready to confront things, not just back off of things. We need to be willing to confront things in order to help people have a chance to come to repentance. Many people don't want to confront things. Well, that's a mistake. The gospel is confrontational. You want to have wisdom on how you do it. You want to do it in line with the word, but you can't back off. Acts chapter 19, verse 8, we see another case. <clears throat> this is where he had come to Ephesus in the first verse. And then he said in the verse 2, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They hadn't even received the Holy Spirit. He ended up ministering the Holy Spirit to them. And they pr pr prayed in tongues and they prophesied, which was the verse before, here in verse 6. And there were 12. He got 12 people that responded. <clears throat> he went in the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. He's deal, trying to deal with these guys time after time after time. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. When divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated his disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So, that shows you that you share the gospel with them. But if they get hardened, start speaking evil, then that's a time to get away. You, know, you give them a chance. If they're not going to listen, then you move on. And suppose people just don't want to even receive the witness. What do you do? Well, you just move on to the next person. Don't get all hung up on that one if they won't receive. Matthew chapter 10. Remember when they went forth and they were to preach the gospel? This is what Jesus said to the disciples. He said, Matthew 10, 14. <clears throat> Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Talking about shaking off the dust of your feet, that was literally symbolic, showing the fact that, you know, you guys have rejected it, I'm moving on to somebody else. You know, as you aren't going to, you're just going to move on and find somebody else to preach the gospel to. That's what God wants. And if you get persecuted because of righteousness sake, you just move on, you know, but don't lose your joy over it. Don't let the enemy beat you down because of what happened. Look what it says in Acts 13, verse 50 and 51. <coughs> It says, the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women, chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. See, one of the things you've got to realize, we'll stop here for a moment. The Bible says that he declares the end from the beginning. What you see happening in the beginning of the church age is going to happen in the end. Because the glory of God was poured out on the first beginning church. A greater glory is going to be poured out on the end time church. But you're going to see the same thing happen. There was persecution in the early church. There's going to be persecution in the end time church. As the church rises, there will be persecution. So these things are going to happen. So you're going to have to be ready to deal with it. The Jews stirred up the devout on them. They raised persecution against them, it said, and expelled them out of their coasts. So they get all bent out of shape about it and sad about it. They shook off the dust off their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Ghost. They weren't going to be moved by it. Don't let the enemy take you down, lose your joy because of situations in the natural. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep on going forth and preach the gospel to whoever will listen. He wants us to be preaching the gospel. And we cannot compromise the gospel either. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. 
This is Paul's testimony. He says, How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, and have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. I mean, he just put, put the word out every way possible. He held nothing back. And in verse 27, I've not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. This is the big error in the body of Christ today, what's called the seeker-sensitive churches approach, which is just preach certain things that people would like, what the seekers would like to hear, so that they'll be happy and they'll want to come. And so you're essentially building your own kingdom instead of preaching the whole counsel of God. You've got to teach it all. You cannot hold anything back. Well, they might not like hearing that. Well, we don't want to deal with that controversial situation. That's a mistake. We have to preach the whole counsel of God. And that is a great mistake. All these ones that are doing this, they're going to have quite a judgment that is going to come upon them in the days to come. Also, God wants you to be one. Remember, you're giving out to others. So he wants you to be a person of prayer. Yes, you're going to be taking hold of the promises, working out your own salvation, taking hold of the promises, casting out the demons, uh, seeing God accomplish all the things that he purposes in your life. But he wants you to be a servant, remember? Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who's one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. God wants you to be a prayer warrior for others, that they would, you're laboring fervently. This is the word, again, idzomai, which means to contend with adversaries. It's translated fight in 1 Timothy 6.12, where it says, fight the good fight of faith. You and I are going to pray, uh, contending against the adversary, fighting that fight in the realm of the Spirit in prayers, all means of prayers, where you're binding, you're loosing, you're casting down, you're interceding, you're speaking forth promises into being, you're praying for them in all manner of prayer, so that they can stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. God wants you to pray for others. Are you praying for others? Don't be so preoccupied with yourself. Yes, you need to take hold of the promises. But be one who's praying for others. Be an intercessor. God wants you to reach out and pray for others so God will accomplish the things that he wants. And you must be ready, <clears throat> to comp again, to confront, compromise. Who, you know, in, in the Jerusalem church, there was Peter and there was John, you know, those these guys that were the leaders of the church there. Well, Paul was the one who got the revelation of all these things. And he's the one that wrote most of the New Testament. And so he comes in Galatians chapter 2, over in verse 11. He said, when Peter was come to Antioch, because they had been in fellowship, and Peter comes to Antioch where he was at, I withstood him to the face. Well, this is Peter who was with Jesus coming. Well, it doesn't matter. You've got to stand up to what's right. I withstood him to the face because he was blunt to be blamed. What was wrong? For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Well, it was okay to eat with them, huh? But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. These are the ones that were Jews that had got born again, but were still following the Old Testament laws. And they were thinking that we're not to be, in part, we're to be apart from the Gentiles or the nations. We're not to have anything to do with them. So he's acting one way at one time and acting another way at another time. That's a compromise. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. They were hypocrites as well, this really means. To act hypocritically is what this word means. They were being hypocrites too. Acting one way one minute, another way another minute. Insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy, is what the word means. Otherwise it was affecting him. Can you allow something to happen that's going to affect somebody that might deceive them? No. You've got to stand up for it. You've got to deal with that thing so that he wouldn't be deceived and think, oh, maybe this is what I should be doing, you know, a certain way, different ways with different people. No, we don't do that whatsoever. When I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all. Now, you might think, well, I need to go talk to him privately. Wait a minute. If he's doing something in front of everybody, you have to confront him in front of everybody because he's had an effect upon them. You can't take him aside. You have to do it to deal with it so Barnabas wasn't going to be adversely affected. So, he says, 
I walked up rightly according to the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing a man's not justified by works of the law. And he talks about how it's through faith of Jesus Christ, all these things. And so he goes to, comes to verse 18. He says, If I build again the things which I destroyed, talk about the Old Testament things of the law, which would be including separate from the Gentiles, I might make myself a transgressor. If you've gone back under the law, Peter, you're now a sinner. Right. That shook him. He rebuked him and corrected him and dealt with him. We have to be ready to confront things. It is not enjoyable to have to confront situations, but you have to do it because you have to stand up for what is the truth in every situation. And that's exactly what Paul did. He did the right thing. Now, how about if someone is overtaken with a fault? What do you do? Of course, you want to see him be restored. Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The spirit of meekness, gentleness, mildness. You aren't going to be condemning them. You aren't going to be harsh. You're not going to be mean. If you, you can never approach anybody that way. You've got to approach someone with love at all times, with a spirit of meekness. So make sure if you are talking to someone, you never come condescending, holier than thou, you know, looking down on someone, harsh, mean. No, they're not going to listen to you anyway when you come across that way. You've got to come across in the right way with a spirit of meekness to help them to come to the place of repentance in their life. <clears throat> at the same time, when you instruct people, they're going to have to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You're not going to be able to get them off of it. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 2.24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that impose themselves. That's your attitude. If per God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, or this really is not a verb, it's a, here, it's talking about the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. They have to come to the truth. They have to come to true repentance in line with the word. But then what? That they, that's the person who is in captivity, may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him, talking about the devil at his will, the devil's will. So they're going to have to recover them out. You're going to pray for them, but you're going to pray for them as such that they will do what the Word says to recover themselves out. Don't think that you're going to be able to recover them out. Make sure that they understand their responsibility. They have to deal with things. And if someone really has repentance, what's real repentance? Yeah, he said, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Otherwise, if you don't have change in fruit, you don't have any repentance at all. You know, real repentance is going to be shown in change, which means the person's going to have to change. So make sure that that person realizes they have to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. They've got to have repentance to the acknowledging the truth. They've got to come back in line with the word of God and start doing what needs to be done. See, we've got to do things according to the word of God. We can't sugarcoat things. We can't just kind of back off and, you know, just handle it. The way. I don't want to really get involved. That's a mistake. We have to deal things according to the Word. You want it to be effective? Do what the Word says. God will work to bring forth what He purposes. Ephesians chapter 4. When you speak to people, how do you speak to them? Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. God wants you to bring words that are bring grace and edifying to the hearers. You're not going to bring corrupt communication. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't be speaking negatives. Don't be coming across in a negative way. If you want to bring forth the truth to edify, to minister at grace, the favor of God to them. Same time, what do you do with all the negatives that maybe you've had? You've got to get rid of them. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you, from you. It's got to all go. You can't have bitterness in your heart. It's defiling you and it'll defile others. It'll come out of you in the way you act. You can't have wrath. You can't have anger. You can't have clamor. You can't have evil speaking. 
Put all those things away. If you haven't got any good, good, anything good to say, don't even open the mouth until you can say something that's right. Put it away from you with all malice. Get rid of it all. We cannot have these kinds of things going on. And what does he want you to do? Be kind one to another. Be kind. Treat people like you'd like to treat you. Do unto others you would have them do unto you. You want somebody to be angry towards you? No. Be kind to them. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Don't hold grudges against them. Forgive. Let it go. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Remember, however you treat people, it's the way God's going to treat you. That's why we've got to make sure. Also, as you treat people, it's what's, what's going to come back to you at the same time. God will cause those things to come to you. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. We've got to walk in love at all times. It is mandatory in the body of Christ. We must do the things that he says. At the same time, again, that doesn't mean that we don't deal with situations. We have to confront them. Ephesians 5.11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove or expose them. Can, can come against them. You're going to con, con, bring the conviction to them so they can come to the place of repentance. Sweeping things under the rug will never solve the problem. They don't go away. Just, you know, hoping, you know, if I just let, let things go, maybe it'll just smooth it over. It doesn't smooth over. It's going to come up again. You have to learn to deal with this. You've got to learn to deal with things in love, in a right way. Bringing forth the Word of God at all times. And ministering life to one another. Over in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. He talks about over here in verse 8. Now put all also off all these things. Put off anger, wrath, malice. Malice is ill will, wanting to get back at someone. Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. We shouldn't have any filthy communication coming out of our mouth. Anything that's foul or obscene. No, none of it. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with the deeds. You put on the new man, renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. <coughs> He comes to verse 12. He says, put on, therefore, and the word put on is this word enduo, which means like to clothe yourself, to put on clothing. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. God wants you to be merciful. Show forth kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, meekness, long-suffering towards others. We're long-suffering. That doesn't mean that we're just going to let things go by, we're going to correct them, we're going to call them to repentance and expect them to come right, but we're going to be long-suffering until they do come to repentance. That's got to be the attitude. Again, it's not like, it just doesn't mean put up and let it go. Uh-uh. There isn't any letting any things go. Forbearing one another. That means really to hold up one another. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against thee, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, love, the bond of perfectness. God wants us to always operate in love at all times in our life. In everything that we do, it's absolutely essential. If we'll do these things, we'll walk right. We also see another thing regarding people that are not walking right. What should we do? We have to confront them, remember? We're going to warn them. But you've got to have wisdom on how you do it. If you do it with an attitude, you will always make a mistake. 1 Thessalonians 5. Is that the scripture? No, I'm sorry. 14. It is not 4. 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. We warn them. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient. Or long-suffering, this means, towards all men. Again, that's our attitudes. If we get these attitudes involved and in, in, ingrained into us and established in us, we'll always handle things as the Lord would have us to handle things. And that's important. But how about a brother who's not walking right? Are you going to continue to have fellowship with him? Verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. 
chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which would be the word of God that you received of us. Otherwise, you don't walk in fellowship with them. He goes on, you yourselves know how we ought to follow us and how we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We're going to walk the right walk. We're not going to compromise for anything. Down in verse 11, we hear that there are some which walk, walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy buddies. Busy buddies. Busy buddies need to be corrected. We can't be busy buddies. Those are gossipers and speaking all this stuff. Want to know everybody's business? No, that's no good. In fact, one of the biggest busy buddy inventions of this time is Facebook. You can look at everybody's business throughout the whole world and find out everything that everybody's doing, you know. You become a busy buddy. Now, there's nothing wrong with it for constructive good things, but if you're out there wanting to know everybody's business, you spend hours and hours and hours, and you're not in the Word, and you're not doing all the things you should be doing, you got a problem. You need to get, the phone, get rid of the phone, get a flip phone or something, so you don't you know, stay on the phone forever and all these things. Problems. We cannot be busy buddies. That's walking disorderly, out of ranks, not walking and doing the things that God wants. He wants us to walk in line with the Word. When we are preaching the gospel to people, what does the Bible say? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Don't give your opinions. Your opinions mean nothing. Don't give your take on it. Well, I think this. It doesn't matter what you think. Well, I feel this way. Your feelings mean nothing. Don't give your feelings. Don't give your thoughts. Don't give your take on it, your opinion. Preach the word. The Word says such and such. And if you don't know what the Word says, then you don't have anything to say. Say, wait a minute, let me go check this out and I'll get back to you. And find out what the Word says and then give them the answer. Don't just think that I have to say something because I, I should say something. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, I really, I need to get the scripture and get back to you on this. Let me have your phone number or let me, let me call you back or let me, I'll, you know, talk to you another time, blah, blah, blah. Don't make a mistake and just decide to give your take on it, which might be totally off track. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. That means you're ready when you're ready to do it, but you're ready when you weren't, weren't even ready to do it. Well, it seems like it's interrupting my time. It doesn't matter. I'm on my way so-and-so. Well, God says, I want you to talk to this person. Take some time to talk to this person. Be ready to preach the word in season and out season. Reprove. To convict. That means you're confronting them on things that aren't right. Rebuke. You're going to be correcting them, this means. Exhort. You're going to be exhorting them in the Word of God with all long-suffering. Otherwise, you don't write them off because they don't agree with you right away and say, too bad, get away, you know. Long-suffering. You're sowing seed. You might be watering seed. Maybe you're dealing with some doctrinal thing that has been established in them throughout their life and they're having a hard time letting go of it, you know. Long-suffering and doctrine and the Word. Again, you always preach the Word and you always bring forth the Word of God and be ready to prove what you say. At the same time, always have your repentance shoes on in case maybe they're right and you're wrong. You could come to the place of repentance because you want to be in line with the Word of God and that's so important. These are all important principles in dealing with relationships. We've begun this this morning. We're going to continue on tonight. We've got a lot to talk about as we cover all these areas of how to deal successfully in, as a Christian in relationships so we do what God wants and not make mistakes. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I commit to walk in love at all times. I will see every person as valuable and precious and important. I will walk in love. I will increase and abound in love. I will love my enemies. I will bless those that curse me. I will do good to those that do evil. I will pray for those that use me or persecute me. I will forgive every person who's wronged me or hurt me. In the name of Jesus, I understand if I don't forgive, 
men their trespasses. God will not forgive me. And if I don't forgive, I'll be turned over to the tormentors. The demons are going to come into me. I will be merciful, and God will show mercy to me. I will serve others. I will not be selfish. I will not be thinking of my own. I'll be looking for how to minister to others. I will mark those that cause division or strife. I will stay away from them. I will confront sin and deal with it and keep coming to correct others as long as they'll listen, but always with the right attitude. I will never go to someone with an attitude or it'll be destructive. I will only go to them in love. I will be ready to con confront people who try to obstruct the gospel in love, in meekness, giving the word of God, instructing them in the truth that they might, receive, might repent to the truth of the word of God. And I will help them to understand how they recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. I will be ready to preach the gospel in season, out of the season. I will preach the word, not my opinions, not my thoughts, not what I feel. I'll make sure it's in line with the word. I'll be ready to dispute and persuade boldly. And I will share everything of the word of God that I'm instructed to bring forth. I will not hold something back. I will pray for others that they might be perfect and complete in all the will of God. I will be ready to, to confront those that compromise so others are not deceived through someone's hypocrisy. I will restore those overtaken with a fault by coming to them in a spirit of meekness I will never be high-minded, condescending, holier than thou, thinking I got it together and you don't. I will come with meekness, gentleness, love, giving them the truth to help them come to repentance. I will only speak words that edify, not corrupt communication. I will be kind. I will be tender-hearted. I will be forbearing. I will be forgiving. I will walk in love with long suffering at all times. I will also withdraw myself from those that walk dis disorderly, not in line with the Word of God. I will not be a busybody knowing everybody's business. I will only know the things that God wants me to know so that I can pray and minister to them and walk in the ways of the word. I thank you, Lord, that as I preach the gospel, I will warn others, I will comfort them, I will support those who are weak, I'll be long-suffering, and I will not compromise in my home. I command my household, after the word of God, to walk in the way of the word of God, so the things God has spoken will come upon me in my life. I will restrain my children from walking in sin. Otherwise, I'd be honoring them above you. I will never honor a person above the Word of God. I will always honor you, Lord, in everything that I do. I do not compromise the Word. I will walk in line with your Word and glorify you. When I walk in your ways, I will please you, and you will bring forth your promises and your blessings in my life, and it will bring forth fruitfulness as I minister to people in right attitudes. Thank you for using me to minister to others, to pray for others, to be a vessel that you can flow through, and I will always operate in love. I'll be long-suffering, I'll be kind, I won't be envious, I won't be prideful or boasting, I won't be um, condescending, I won't be seeking my own, I won't be easily irritated, easily angered, 
I will believe good things about every person. I will always operate in love. I see everybody as valuable, precious, and of great worth. And I will minister to them as I would have God to minister to me. I thank you, Lord. I will walk in line with your word in all relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. We begun this this morning. We're going to be talking more about it this evening. Praise God. Father, I thank you. Each one of us are going to take heed to this. If there's areas where we need to clean up and correct, we thank you that we receive your word. We'll do it. Father, I thank you. We're going to walk in line with your word, so we will be the true disciples of the Lord. Thank you. There'll be much fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen.